Hello everyone, welcome back. I'm Yogi Doug Johnson. I'm back with a talk about your mind not being your friend. Uh, in a recent talk I gave, a student of mine said that that uh, spoke to her or stood out and she wanted me to do a talk on this. And so I'll do that. I have another student who wanted me to do a talk on karma and don't worry, <laughs> that talk is coming. It's a little more in depth, so it's taking me a little while to collect all my scriptural references and ideas on that, but that is going to come. So before I do the talk though, I want to thank all my patrons on Patreon, everyone who contributes via PayPal, Venmo, everyone who comes to class, everyone who comes to the kirtans and the events. Thank you so much. You allow me to continue doing this work. And everyone who's on uh, YouTube who comments and subscribes, hits the bell icon, gives me a thumbs up. All of those things help spread the word and uh, get it out there. So I appreciate you on that. Okay, so your mind is not your friend. I remember um, many decades ago when I was practicing Zen at the Atlanta Soto Zen Center, my teacher came in one day and we were meditating first and then he gave a little talk, which was not uncommon at that time and he said what does it mean when you have an absolutely uh, horrendous thought or an atrocious thought right have you ever had that happen to you that you had an absolutely horrible thought about somebody or something maybe you thought of doing a deed that actually maybe scared you or you thought god how could i think that or you know maybe you're you're a parent your child is being horrible and you a thought pops up i wish you were never born now maybe you never said that or you never believed it but that thought still came up i think if you have observed your mind at all if you have any uh self introspection self awareness that's happened to you uh cuz i think it's actually a very universal human experience uh, if you think it's never happened to you, chances are you've simply blocked that memory out. Uh, it's not that it didn't happen, it's just that you have denied the fact that it's happened, um, which is also very common for us human beings. We like to have an image or idea of ourselves, and most of us like to think we're good people. So many of us are actually identified with our mind, and if we have an evil thought, a bad thought, uh, an atrocious thought, we might very quickly try and disown that experience and say that it never happened. So we just sort of sweep that under the rug and forget that it ever happened. So my teacher said, what does it mean if this happens to us? We have an absolutely horrific thought. And we were all kind of dumbfounded. Now, I don't think anyone answered the question. No one knew where he was going with this. And he came back with, that's the nature of mind. So again, we as human beings, I think our mind and our thoughts are, it's one of our most treasured possessions, isn't it? We see ourselves as somehow probably better than the animal, mineral, and uh, vegetable kingdoms because of our thoughts that we can think. Uh, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, right? In fact, he's saying, you may not even exist except for the fact that you have thoughts. You can recognize you have thoughts. That's how you actually know you exist. That's what Descartes is basically saying. So interesting stuff, huh? What does it mean if our mind has a horrific thought? That is the nature of mind. Many of us don't want to believe this idea. We want to think the mind is good. The mind is our friend. The mind is here to help us. And there's some truth to that, but as you'll see hopefully in today's talk, there's a lot of misperception and misconception about the nature of mind. Another spiritual teacher, Maharaji, uh, I listened to a talk of his this was also maybe around the same time, probably about 20 plus years ago. He was giving a talk and he said, you know, your mind is like a friend who you keep inviting into your house. And every time you invite them in, 
they take something from your house. They steal something from you. And then your friend leaves and you think, oh, what happened to my favorite piece of pottery? What happened to my glasses? What happened to that cup that I like so much? And then your friend comes back the next day and knocks on your door, you let them in, they stay for a while, they leave, and again, something is missing. And he said that this is how most people treat their thoughts and their mind. They never question or stop to think of, is this really actually good for me? They're not actually perceiving whether or not this presence is something that's actually helpful or harmful. And they just invite it back in. The minute it comes knocking, you have another thought. You say, all right, come on, thought. And you just jump right in with it. There's never a moment where you're questioning that thought, where there's some space between you and that thought, where you can say, you know what? I'm not going to let you in. I'm not going to let that thought in, right? So there's just, it's an immediate thing. You hear the knock, you let it back in. So he likened the mind and the ego to like this friend that you just keep inviting back in. It keeps stealing from you. But because you're not paying attention to this relationship, you just keep welcoming it back in. Another example I'd like to give, and this is hopefully one that you can verify for yourself. These other two examples are, we're sort of trusting the word of a teacher, right? But uh, another example I can give is a nightmare. So we recognize that when we're dreaming, the everything we see and perceive is a mind-created event, right? Does, there, does anyone want to argue with me about that? That in your dreams, you create the people, you create the places, you create the circumstances, or your mind does, right? So you're creating this entire universe in your dreams. And then, if that were the case, if the mind were our friend, when we go to sleep, wouldn't our mind create just the most lovely, wonderful experience for us every time? If the mind was like, I want you to have peace and joy, the world is stressful enough, isn't it? Life is stressful enough. So at least when we're sleeping, our mind can say, okay, well, I'm just gonna give you everything you wanted during your dreams. I'm gonna give you everything that you wanted. It could be day by day, right? We sleep almost every day. So it could say, you know what, let's replay today and let's just fix all those problems. Let's just make today go smoothly. But that's not often what happens, right? We have nightmares. Many people have re reoccurring nightmares. So not only is our mind not uh, bringing us what we want when it is in complete control, it's actually bringing us our worst fear, our worst nightmare, quite literally, the mind is bringing that to us, okay? So hopefully these examples have begun to plant the seeds that, okay, maybe my mind isn't on my side. Maybe it's not so friendly. So your mind is definitely not your friend. It's not good at bringing you peace, joy, love, happiness. These are the things that we want. It doesn't matter who we are. Okay, if you think you want success, it's because you think it's gonna make you happy and it's gonna bring you peace on some level. Whatever it is, if you think you want a relationship, same thing. If you think you want um, money, a billion dollars, it's because you think it's gonna bring you peace, joy, happiness, okay? So whatever it is we're seeking in life as human beings, we are seeking peace, joy, happiness, love, connection, that sense of oneness, okay? It doesn't matter if you're a punk rocker or you're a hippie, or you're an executive or anything. Whoever you are, if you're human, whatever pursuits you have in the world is ultimately because you think it's going to bring you happiness, peace, joy, okay? So thinking is not good at bringing you these things, all right? Thinking is really a survival tool. So a skunk has its smell, that's a survival tool. A porcupine has its quills. That's again, a survival tool. 
human has her thoughts. That is a survival tool. Now it's a very useful survival tool. We human beings have gained pretty much uh, dominance on this planet. In fact, we may be in the process of completely destroying the planet. That's how powerful we are. And partly because we have not checked this tool that we have, the mind. In my last talk, I likened the mind to a, um, like a chainsaw. And if you give it to someone who doesn't have enough strength to pull the chainsaw up or can't control the chainsaw and it's just going every which way and it's just cutting things up, cutting up the floor. That's pretty much the relationship that most people have with their minds. And it's destroying their body, it's destroying their health, it's destroying their happiness, it's destroying the happiness of those around them. Uh, and yet, they have no idea that this is what's going on. The tool is just completely out of control and they have no idea about that. They just assume that that's, they actually identify with the mind and they actually think they need to defend their mind and what it thinks and their beliefs and their ideas. And some people will even die for that. So your mind's not here to make you happy or bring you peace. Otherwise, everyone who had a mind would be happy, right? Every human would just have their mind producing happiness for them. But it's a tool. And again, some people, it might look like that tool is bringing them a lot of stuff and that that stuff is making them happy. But hopefully if you're watching this talk, you've seen through that. You know that stuff and fame, uh, relationship, those things in and of themselves will not bring you happiness. They can be part of being happy. Um, they can be part of um, something that brings you happiness, but they can't bring you happiness in and of themselves. There has to be something else in place for those things to elevate you like that. So they can add to your happiness. They cannot bring you happiness. Okay, there's a difference there. So most of us are taught uh, that our mind very often is just sort of to be used for regurgitation. A lot of times this happens in education. We're given a lot of facts and numbers and formulas and things and we're sort of given the reward, we're patted on the back, we're given an A when we're able to regurgitate facts you know, perfectly. We're able to repeat what the teacher had told us in lecture perfectly. So the mind isn't used critically, it's sort of used as a storage device. Okay, so this is, I'm generalizing of course, but this is very, very true for a lot of people. It's just sort of like if you have a great memory, if you have a good storage device, you can breeze through school and modern education without really thinking critically, without learning how to question your thoughts or question the information that you're being given. It's just sort of like monkey see, monkey do on a mental level, okay? So spirituality, we can't accept that. We don't want to do that. We want to start to question because again, if we don't, the thought is, our thoughts are really in control. So most people actually identify with their thoughts. They defend their thoughts. Some people will even die uh, for their beliefs and their thoughts. And they see this as a, they're very proud to do this. They see this as a very good thing. Uh, I'm not saying commenting one way or the other, but I'm just saying that there have been people who have died for their beliefs or thoughts. There have also been people who wanted to kill others for their beliefs or thoughts, or have nearly killed others for their beliefs or thoughts. Okay, so human history is littered with examples of this. So again, this is how much importance we will give to our thoughts. And oftentimes, again, we will actually identify with our thoughts. Most people have at least some identity with the body, um, but almost everyone identifies with their thoughts on some level. So even someone who's very sort of spiritually aloof and they might say, well, I'm not the body. 
they still very often, even though they might say I'm not my mind, they very often are still identified with their beliefs and thoughts, whether they realize it or not. And again, they will get very upset if their beliefs are questioned, they will argue, they will fight, they'll insist on being right. And again, this is a basically ego uh, response to it being threatened. So we know the ego is identified with our thoughts when it's sort of taking that kind of aggressive stance with trying to defend our thoughts like that. So can thought see itself? Can an eye see itself without a mirror, without something else to reflect its own image back to itself? What is it within us that is able to see a thought? Okay, these are things that many people never question or look at or ask. The thought appears in their mind, they just, again, accept it. Like Maharaji said, you invite that friend back in, you say, oh, old friend, thought, come on in. Let's have, a sit, let's have some tea. <laughs> and your friend robs you. What does your friend rob you of? Your peace, your joy, your happiness, peace of mind, right? Thought, disturbing thought comes in. What if I get coronavirus? What if I die alone? What if I run out of money? What if these people don't like me? What if they're talking about me? Whatever it is, uh, thoughts and the way the human mind is structured is not friendly, generally speaking, okay? Uh, modern science is coming out, uh, uh, cognitive behavioralism and other um, um, modern biology, these sciences are coming out and saying that the mind likely evolved for survival, not for happiness. And it's likely that the ancestors of ours that survived were the ones who were more afraid and thinking of all these different scenarios and worried about different things. So you might be thinking, well, great, then I'm going to survive and I'm going to thrive because I got this worried mind. But the environment that our ancestors were in was very different than the modern environment. There was no news. There was no internet. We weren't constantly barraged with information from around the world. It's really too much for an individual human mind to process and to deal with. We had a very small world and a very small world of problems, you might say. Okay, there weren't all these moving parts that a modern human has to deal with. So our mind is not really adapted to the modern world. It's not really efficient. It's not really able to do its job as it's meant to. The good news is we can update the mind. How? Through spiritual practice. And again, it's not only these ancient traditions that are telling us this, but modern science is more and more getting on board with the idea that meditation is very powerful for rewiring the brain. So just because a thought shows up, does it mean it belongs to you? So if I have a thought show up in my mind, does it belong to me? Is it my thought? Do I need to defend that thought? What about if it shows up in my head, does that mean that the thought is right automatically? Because it showed up in my head, right? Many of us assume, again, well, I thought this, so now I need to argue and defend that I'm right. What if the next time someone questions a thought you have, you just say, oh, that's interesting. Okay, maybe you're right. Why do we have to go to bat on being right or correct about a certain thought? Have you ever wondered about that? Just because you think something about, say you think someone at work is lazy. A lot of times then we'll go to our coworker and we'll point that out. Maybe they'll agree. And if they don't agree, very often we'll start to bring up, well, what about this? And she always does that and on and on. 
So again, just begin to observe these tendencies in your own mind. Okay, that's what's spiritual teaching is really always about observing yourself. So although I'm speaking in a kind of a third person or talking in general, these are all things that you are supposed to look at in yourself. It does not help if you see it in others. Okay, it's really only helpful if you begin to spot it in yourself and not so you feel guilty. Okay, this isn't about you being a bad person or being unspiritual or being unenlightened or unawake. This is just very pragmatic advice. This is spiritual work, real spiritual work. Okay. So what is the mind? In yoga, it's said that the mind is the perfect servant and a horrible master. So for most people, you could say they are absent or asleep. And you could say the mind, which is supposed to serve humanity, serve the human being, uh, is actually running the show. Again, all of its worries, its concerns, its greed, um, all of the, its sense of separation, again, what we call the ego, it sees itself as separate from others and the environment. That is absolutely not true. We are not the same as others. That's also not true, but we are also not separate. In Zen, this is expressed as not one, not two. So sometimes I find in yoga circles, you know, people get all kumbaya and they want to say everything is one. Well, from a Zen perspective, this is not correct. Absolutely not. Everything is not one. Okay. This hand is different than this hand. I am different from you. That's just obvious. That should be obvious. But what we don't see is that we're not separate. Okay. This hand is connected to this hand. If you follow it back, they are connected. And what may be less obvious is that I'm actually connected to this room that I am in, and I'm connected to the planet Earth, and I'm connected to you. However, indirectly, we are affecting one another. We are connected. So not one, not two. If you say all is one, you're wrong. If you say there are many things and they are separate, you're wrong. So again, this is very Buddhist in this approach. Not one, not two. Okay, it's very, very powerful teaching. So your mind is a tool. It is supposed to be your servant. But if you aren't present, right? Eckhart Tolle talks a lot about presence. Many spiritual teachers talk about present, being present. If you are not present, then you are not able to use your mind. And if you are not using your mind, it is using you. I promise you. There's no question about that. Okay. And again, if thoughts simply popping up in your mind are unquestioned and simply acted upon, then your mind is using you. And this is the condition of most of humanity. It's only with some spiritual awakeness that we begin to slow this process down. We begin to question our thoughts. We begin to observe our mind. Okay. Then we can actually turn the mind into an ally. There's a book out there. I haven't actually read it, but the title of the book is turning the mind into an ally. And that's by the son of Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche. So turning the mind into an ally, actually turning your mind into your friend, because it's not, it's not your ally. It's not your friend. It's your master, unless you have learned to master it. So have you ever felt run down, ragged, depressed, tired of everything? Why can't you just stop? Why can't you just say, I'm not doing this anymore. I feel awful, right? Who's really in control? So for most of us, it's our mind and we can't stop because of fear. 
and fear is the ego's best friend. Your ego is happy to build you up if you're having some success. It tells you, oh, you're so great. You're so awesome. Look at you. You're so pretty. You're so talented. Whatever it is, you have a little bit of success. It begins to run away with it. But if you observe just as readily, it'll cut you down. It's happy to make you the villain, to tell you that you're worthless, to show all the ways in which you're inferior to others. Your ego doesn't care. What it looks for is separation. It wants to see difference. So if it can put other people down here and put you up here, it loves that. It also loves the opposite. You're down here and other people are up here. And very often the ego has a whole system in place. It has certain people who are below it, right? Think about your day. Think about as you go around and you meet and interact with people, all right? Um, the, per the checkout person at the grocery store, a cabbie or a Lyft driver, uh, your server at the restaurant, and then other people you might uh, not meet as often, but maybe you meet Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or a movie star or a starlet. We have a lot of movie production in Atlanta now, so maybe you run into somebody who's famous and they're up there, right? You don't treat them the way you treat other people. So this is the ego at work. The ego loves that stratification. Again, we are different than others and we are not connected, not in a real meaningful way. So your ego, again, it's will try defending you if someone criticizes you, but notice you still won't feel good. Uh, if someone criticizes you, you'll get angry, you'll get upset, you'll feel wounded. Maybe you'll curse the person out or very often the ego strategy is to point out that person's faults, right? To say, oh, but you do this and you do that and you do that. So you're worse than me. <laughs> it's very often kind of the way the, the ego responds. But let's say that somebody breaks through all of that, that defensiveness, and that this can happen, right? If someone we respect, someone we love criticizes us, if enough people criticize us, our ego can very often then again turn and it starts attacking us and making us feel bad. And we experience very often two emotions that I like to call worthless emotions, and that's shame and guilt. Now, this isn't to say we shouldn't learn from our mistakes. Absolutely, we should. We should also be open to criticism and learning um, you know, from what other people say about us. But we can do that without guilt and shame. That's maybe, again, what many people don't understand is we don't need guilt and shame to look at something we've done and say, oh, that, that was not skillful, that was not good, that was not helpful, there's a better way to do that. And it takes a certain amount of self-awareness and awakeness in order to receive criticism and to look at it objectively and to not feel guilt and shame about it and maybe to simply make changes. It's not to say that all criticism is warranted. Sometimes people will attack you I think Jesus is a great example of this. He was so loathed that he was basically crucified. He was, was crucified. He was murdered. He was killed by a community who saw him as kind of a troublemaker. And he did nothing but heal people and teach. <laughs> he was, I imagine, in his lifetime, the embodiment of love for those that got him. But interestingly, in this world, the ego actually very often feels threatened by love. It feels attacked by, in the presence of love. So it's not surprising to me at all that that's what happened to Jesus. If he was exuding love, many people were going to feel threatened by that. 
And I think they did. And I think they took the action that they felt they needed to, to stay safe. <laughs> so your ego is not your friend. It has no alliance or allegiance to you. In Buddhism, the mind is seen as an additional sense organ. So just as your ears hear sounds and your eyes uh, have sights, your tongue has taste, your skin has feel, your mind receives thoughts, okay? And this is a great way to look at the mind. So just as your senses can be fooled, your mind also can be in error, okay? All of us have heard our name called when it wasn't, right? Everyone's had that experience. You hear your name, you, you turn around, what? And they say, oh, I wasn't talking to you. Or we've all seen things that weren't there, right? We look at, very quickly, we see something, or we think we recognize somebody. This has happened to everybody. And again, if it hasn't happened to you, it simply means you've blocked it out of your awareness. Um, it's happened to everybody. Our senses are not perfect. Our brain is not perfect at decoding what the senses are receiving, okay? So it's, it's not just one thing, and it's the same with our thoughts. While we may receive a thought, our brain may interpret that thought in a certain way that may actually be unhelpful, unskillful, uh, very damaging. So again, who is it who is observing these thoughts, interpreting these thoughts? Is it you? Are you present? Or is it simply the mind sort of running mechanistically on its own? This is what how most people are. Their brain is just running on overdrive, nonstop, one thought after another, after another, just a constant stream. So one of the things we do in meditation is we begin to lighten that up, to change that relationship with thought. So another interesting question is, do you think you can control your thoughts? If you do, then try thinking only happy thoughts from now until your death. I promise you, you'll be a happier person. So in every situation, no matter what situation you find yourself in, just think happy, good, peaceful thoughts and you will be a happy, peaceful person. Even if someone is robbing you or stabbing you, just think happy thoughts and you will be happy, I promise you. you. Might be in a lot of pain, but you can be happy and be in pain at the same time. But if you've observed the mind in meditation like I have and like others have, then you know that this isn't really possible. Some people will say they can do this other people will say they can stop their thinking. But this isn't my experience with the mind. The nature of mind isn't like that. While the mind may quiet and stop on its own, that's not something you do. It's something that you allow to happen and then the mind will stop on its own. So this idea that you're controlling the mind isn't really what's going on there. Um, that isn't the true nature of that relationship. Just as you can influence what you see, uh, for instance, if I want to see the Grand Canyon, I can pull up a picture of the Grand Canyon on the internet, I can look at it. I can go to the Grand Canyon, I can look at it. So I can definitely say I want to see the Grand Canyon and then I can at least to some degree make that happen. But am I going to be able to control that? What if I said I only want to see the Grand Canyon from now until I die? Am I really going to be able to do that? No. And so the same is true with happy thoughts. I want to think this one thing or this one way for the rest of my life. Well, that's not really the nature of mind. Uh, again, we can select thoughts, we can let go of thoughts, we can do these things, but there's a limited amount of influence that we really have. 
we aren't really in control. We're sort of working with a force of nature. Uh, that's closer to the truth. Just like as we work with our body, right? Yes, I can raise and lower my hands to some degree, but I can't fly. So, in a sense, I am in control of my body, but it's a limited amount of control. I have certain injuries, and if I were in complete control of my body, I would simply heal them instantly, wouldn't I? I would also never get sick. I would never get the coronavirus. I would never have any problems, right? So control is overstepping the truth. We do have influence over what the body does. I'm making my hands do this right now, but I don't have control, not complete control. My body does things I don't want it to do, just like I have thoughts I'd rather not have. I see things I don't want to see. I hear things I don't want to hear. This is the nature of reality. Okay, now I'm not saying you can't work with your thoughts or that you shouldn't do that, but saying that you can control your thoughts, this is, this is absolutely not true. So you can choose, you can influence, but you can't control the mind. And the best method that I have seen or learned for controlling the mind or influencing the mind is to watch the mind. How do you learn to watch the mind? You learn to meditate. If you want to learn to meditate, I've posted in the past instructions for meditation. I um, uh, probably need to do that again because each time I give the instructions, they're different. Please don't ever assume that if you've heard my instructions for meditation that you got it and that you're done. Uh, you can hear the instructions for meditation over and over and over again, the same instructions, and learn something new. In addition to this, each time I give the instructions, very often there's a slight different slant on it. So listening again intently, you may hear something that you didn't hear before. But this is really how we turn the mind from our master into our servant, as we begin watching it. So again, if you think of a, a uh, servant at home, you hire somebody to serve you. And if you're not watching them, just like the friend who comes over, at a certain point, the servant might just start doing whatever she wants to do. She doesn't clean up like you asked. She doesn't do any of the things you asked her to do because you're never there, you're never present, you're never watching or observing. But if you're present and you're watching and you say, hey, you didn't do what I asked you to do, could you please do that? Then she's a lot more likely to do her job, do what she's supposed to do. So again, I hope that this was helpful in illustrating this point. Your mind is not your friend, it's not your ally, at least not out of the gate. It is a tool but you must take control of this tool, okay? You must be the one to be present with it. And as I said, the nature of mind can be very tricky, very slippery. I think in the Bhagavad Gita, there is a section where um, Krishna and Arjuna are talking about the mind. And I think it's Krishna is saying, it's like the wind, it blows this way and that way. Or maybe it's Arjuna when he's asking about, you know, what to do with the mind. Um, so, we see the mind is very slippery, it's very difficult to get a handle on. So from my perspective, the Buddha really got it right. He said, don't try to control it, watch it, observe it, pay attention, and then it begins to function as it is meant to function. Okay, when we show up, when we're present, when we're the master of the house, okay, then the mind starts doing its job as it is meant to do. When we are not present, when we are lost in our thoughts, when we believe every thought, when we defend every thought, when we get upset 
because we have an upsetting thought. When we ride that roller coaster up and down all the time, then we are not present and our mind is running us ragged. We will have illness, we will have anxiety, we will have sleeplessness, we will have a lot of conflict, we will have suffering because we are believing every thought and we are listening to our thoughts in our mind. We aren't putting it in its proper place. Again, how do I put it in its proper place? I begin to observe. I begin to watch the mind. How do I learn to do that? Learn to sit Zen. Learn to meditate. You can reach out to me. I'm happy to teach you. Again, I have videos. We can do sessions. You can find a teacher. There are Zen centers everywhere. Okay? So watch the mind. Put it in its place. Use the mind instead of it using you. All right, everyone. Thanks again for listening. If there's any way that I can help you on your journey, please reach out. Let me know. Leave a comment. Tell me how you're doing. I'd love to hear from you. And until next time, namaste and have a great day.